lightning talks uh, from six uh, authors uh, regarding policy. So, I uh, haven't seen Devi yet, so maybe we start with Tim. Hi, uh, my name is Tim Alclair. I'm a software engineer at Google and co-chair SIGAuth. Um, and so I was just gonna give an update on uh, some of the things that we're thinking about in uh, SIGAuth in the policy space. Um, so here's a bunch of policies and policy-like things that we have in Kubernetes. Um, and what do they all have in common? Uh, Aside from being policy-like things, that's, that's about it. Um, they're bound in different ways. Uh, some of these things are cluster level, some of them are namespace level, some are bound to users, some are bound to service accounts, some are bound to namespaces. Um, they're all specified through uh, different schemas. Um, that don't have a lot of consistency between them. Um, some are fail open, some are uh, you know, closed by default and you open them up and vice versa. Um, and so this is something that we wanna improve in the future. Um, I linked at the bottom here to the GitHub issue discussing this. Um, but before we talk about improving the policies, I just wanted to take a step back um, and uh, question like what policies we should even be talking about um, in the first place. Um, uh, we're gonna talk about OPA a little later in this deep dive, um, but kind of one of the questions we have is which of these policies should we actually be like building into Kubernetes and which of them should we be delegating to uh, other tools that specialize in uh, policy management? like. I don't want us to end up re-implementing OPA in YAML in Kubernetes CRDs in order to you know, uh, support all of the possible combinations of policies. Um, and so I think this is maybe the most important question that we have uh, in the working group and uh, SIG auth uh, and the communi Kubernetes community uh, is to kind of get at this. Um, and then once we've decided what the policies we actually want to support are, um, how can we make them behave more consistently um, and fix some of the stuff that I was just complaining about in the previous slide. Um, so along the lines of uh, you know, consistent behavior, um, I put three questions over on the left that are, uh, uh, I think, some of the biggest questions for how to make those behave consistently. Um, should they be namespace scoped or cluster scoped or both? Um, how those policies get bound to someone or something uh, should be uh, at least somewhat consistent. Um, and you know, if you're uh, depending on what types of objects you're dealing with uh, and and what your enforcement mechanisms look like, there's going to be some variation here. I don't expect us to have one, you know, policy. Uh, template that fits every every possible combination, but um, I think we should come up with more like guidelines of uh, when you're adding a new policy. Um, this is sort of how you uh, how you think about it, um, and then also how those compose. Uh, one of the big problems with uh, a few of our policies right now is if you have um, you know maybe your cluster administrator and your security group and your namespace administrator and they all want to set some different parts of the policy, uh, some of these things don't really compose well right now. Um, and so that's something I'd like to fix. Um, and, and one idea, um, this isn't uh, anything uh, final, but just something we've been throwing around is uh, sort of take inspiration from the way firewalls are designed um, and uh, have policies that sort of match the objects uh, and then just take an action uh, when the policy is matched against the object. And so that might be accept, allow this request uh, or action, uh, deny, or uh, something we've been debating is also whether uh, defaulting should be handled by the, the policy management um, or mutations in general. Um, and uh, yeah, so.
I think that's all I had to say about that. I guess we're doing questions at the end. So. Thank you. Thank you as well. OK. Hi, everyone. I'm Michael Elder. So Kube Arbiter. Who's familiar with Kube Arbitrator today? Great. Then these are the slides for you. OK. So Kube Arbitrator is really a combination of Kubernetes and high-performance computing. So what we're doing is we're trying to figure out how do, oh, I'm not going to laser. Oh, they did not give me laser powers. Sad. All right. Oh, or, S in the middle, in top, top middle. Uh, I'll need more technical training. All right. <laughs> Kubernetes is about long-running workloads. High-performance computing is typically about batch processing, where I have a specific problem that I'm trying to solve, and I'm running it through uh, lots of parallel computation. So if I look at the use cases, batch processing, I'm looking at use cases where I'm submitting jobs. I need to balance how resources are assigned to those jobs. So I'm scheduling them with certain topologies or constraints that are layered on top of that. And then I need to have a good way to sort of say, look, here I'm going to give you a particular queue job. This is one of the resource types that comes along with um, one of the components of Kube Arbitrator. And this allows me to say this particular bit of work, has this sort of priority, requires this kind of resource, et cetera. And then I need something to sort of play uh, referee so that all of these jobs as they're coming onto the field can be allocated the right amount of resource and I can prioritize how much compute capacity or resources are assigned to them as they go. So Kube Batch D is one of the components that's part of Kube Arbitrator today. This is the piece that actually defines sort of the working model for Q job as well as the, uh, the queues themselves, and we'll talk about what that looks like in a moment. This basically runs, though, uh, as a deployment on top of Kubernetes and allows it to interact with the broader system and sort of put a layer on top of Kube Scheduler. We'll see what that looks like in just a moment. So when we're looking at Kube Batch D, what we're really seeing is here's a way to define queues, which is where I file work to be completed, and then I'm submitting a set of queue jobs into those queues that each have these sort of relative weightings and priorities and requests for resources. And it's trying to do this balancing act of, of how to assign resources and how to prioritize. So what's the difference between Kube Arbitrator and Kube Scheduler? Sort of sounds like the start to a bad joke, maybe? No? All right. Must have been a bad joke. So in this case, though, what it's really doing is it's putting another layer of scheduling on top of the Kube Scheduler work that is really optimized for sort of long-running workloads and allowing it to, to put this additional model of scheduling on top, right? Queues, which then are submitted into, uh, into those queues or queue jobs with this kind of prioritization. And so by default, the Kube Arbiter is pluggable, and there's something called dominant resource uh, fairness, which is the balancing algorithm that's used to sort of weight who gets more resource than others. And ultimately, this is to support things like TensorFlow, right, Spark, et cetera. So when we think about policies here, the ability for a pod to say, here is when I'm capable of being disrupted, because we're going to allocate as much capacity or balance capacity between long-running workloads and batch processing as we can. But when significant new workload comes on board, we need to know who can we take out of the pool? Who can we preempt and therefore give that capacity to something that's, that's higher precedence? And you'll see the introduction of things like priority classes. So I think there's a lot of capability here in Kube Arbitrator that needs more attention in terms of how it defines policy, and now we integrate that with the rest of the platform. Dynamic quota allocation is the second use case. Here we're looking at really what are some of the specific workload scheduling algorithms I can kind of plug into the batch D processor. And so cube quota alloc is the default one that's available today. This implements this domain, uh, excuse me, dominant resource fairness. And if you don't know what that is, I didn't know either until I put this together, but here's a quote that kind of summarizes it. It's basically from a set of high performance literature that allows you to balance so that users are not exploiting the system in order to get access to more resource than they're allowed, right? So the key thing there is that this means that as I submit lots of different research projects or different um, work that I want to complete, I'm allocating resource to each of those as, as optimally as I possibly can without allowing any one of those to game the system and get more than they're really uh, supposed to have access to. This is a little bit about how it works. <clears throat> 
And so there's already a, a proposal that we're discussing in the work group around improvements to the scheduling policy. And I think a lot of those improvements today are somewhat security related placement issues or um, uh, preventing certain workloads from kind of taking over certain segments of the cluster that they're not supposed to. This, I think, is a slightly different problem, which is really about optimization and optimization of the capacity on the cluster. So I think one of the areas that we'll do more of is looking at how does how do the improvements in Kube Arbitrator get brought down into Kube Scheduler and then also influence the ongoing discussion with the topology uh, scheduling proposal that we have. A few references here. Um, most of this I think I've just said. And there's one slide that's not in this version, so apparently my last update didn't take, but I do want to give a shout out to uh, Klaus Ma and uh, Dama, who's one of the uh, maintainers on this project, who most of this actually came from, so he would have been here presenting it otherwise, was unable to travel. So thanks to, to Klaus and others who contributed there. All right, I think since I see David, if you want to jump up here, what we're gonna do is reorder just a little bit. <laughs> Do you remember all that, guys? Did you absorb it all? And David's going to show us some code, and then we'll transition from there. OK. Um, I have a, also like a link to a video. Is that going to work at all or not really? Uh, it should. I think it's on his laptop, so you can comment if, if it works. OK, because the laptop is not showing what's up on the screen. So um, the first couple of slides are, do not have a video on it, but then, yeah. Um, so I was going to go do a couple slides and then come back to this one and then click on that, but not yet. At the end is the demo. Is that okay? Absolutely. Okay. I can't do that. Cool. Thanks. Um, yeah. So thanks. I'm going to talk about uh, Security Profile, which is an uh, open source project we are working on at Google. Um, and the idea is to create a small menu of versioned, community curated uh, policy profiles to enable uh, turnkey cluster creation um, with desired security and tenant isolation. Actually, I think there was a slide. Oh, I guess there wasn't a slide before this. Um, but uh, right, so the problem that we're trying to solve is that today um, it's pretty hard for administrators to figure out what policies uh, they need for their use case. They have to um, figure out pod security policy, network policy, um, all of the different uh, RBAC uh, policies, um, and uh, and so and quotas and so on. And so um, the idea here is that we want to give sort of predefined uh, typical. Uh, uh, security uh, um, and multi-tenancy policy configurations kind of packaged up and named and versioned. And so to give you an example of experience, you would do something like kubeatom admit init and say you wanted to use a certain security profile like this one called default and then those numbers at the end are a version number um, or like you're running a multi-tenant uh, software as a service on your cluster so that might be another uh, uh, published security profile. And then you would be able to upgrade your cluster or upgrade the security profile, either one, to a new version, and it would just work across upgrades. Um, so that's kind of the basic idea of the security profile. Um, the way it works under the covers is that there are three constituents of it. Um, one is what we call bootstrapping rules. So these are command line flags, like for the API server or for the kubelet. Um, cluster scope policy objects like pod security policy, um, and then namespace scope policy objects like network policy. Uh, and then um, these policies uh, get kind of unwrapped from the security profile, which is an object that aggregates all of them. Uh, they get unwrapped and applied to the cluster by uh, different enforcers that, uh, that you can choose from uh, that are kind of pre-existing pieces of the system today. So like the bootstrapping rules uh, might uh, be applied by kubeatom when it brings up the cluster. The pod security policy might be applied by kubectl apply. Uh, and then this idea we have here of the namespace scope policy objects, those have to be populated into the namespace when the namespace gets created. And so uh, you can do that like with an admission controller or initializer. And then um, that box that's kind of floating off to the side is just to uh, mention that uh, the intention is to integrate these profiles with Kubernetes conformance so that uh, you can be sure that the set of kind of standard published named profiles uh, works on any platform. So whether you're using uh, any of the cloud providers or uh, on-prem using like Cubatom, uh, that it'll just work. So I think that was, yeah, those were the slides. And so I just want to give you a quick demo. If I click on this, will this work? 
maybe. Okay, cool. So I can't. See, uh, let me see. Can I make it bigger? Uh, full screen. Like just like this. Uh, sorry. Oh, it's hard to see it from here. Yeah, it's tough. Okay, thanks. Okay, right. So um, the part we missed was uh, bringing up the, was running Cubatom. And so this is a demo of integration with Cubatom. And so it was doing Cubatom. Uh, uh, no, no, it's fine. It's fine. Um, I don't want to take too long. Uh, so it was uh, kind of applying uh, the policies um, uh, when it brought up the cluster, and then, by the way, this uh, demo was put together by uh, my, uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Yi Sui, who, who is uh, actually the person who implemented this system. Um, so now we're going to, it says, well, you can read it. It says, join a node and install uh, Calico um, because that supports uh, network policy. So this, uh, maybe we should run this in like 1.25 speed. It's like a five minute video. Um, but uh, yes. We'll post a link to the, to the slide as well. So we the video link. And then um, I think we're going to do a watch over on the right side uh, waiting for the nodes uh, to be ready. Yeah, I can try to do this, speed this up to one. Well, actually, maybe not. Um, <laughs> all right, so uh, now we're going to check and see that the security profiles were uh, installed. Um, so the security profile is a CRD. Um, and when we brought up the cluster, it installed these three security profiles. None of them are activated yet, but the definitions are represented as custom resources. Um, and then there's this concept of a security profile selector, which lets you choose which of the loaded security profiles you want to activate in the cluster. So in this case, um, the one that was uh, chosen, I guess, was the, uh, well, the default 1.0.0. .0 .0. Um, and now that we set the security profile selector to choose the default 1.0-0 profile. Uh, it should take effect, and one of the things that it'll do uh, is uh, to ensure that when that the network policy that's defined in that security profile gets populated into the existing namespaces, and then not only will it get populated into the existing namespaces, but also when we create a new namespace, the network policy from that profile will automatically get populated into the new namespace. So that should be what's going on now. Um, so we will check what's inside the namespace. And hopefully it should have the, um, so this new namespace we created was demo one, and hopefully it will have the Network policy. I didn't actually watch the video before the demo, so when I say hopefully, I'm not just like feigning surprise whether this works or not. I'm just trusting that it does. Um, so yeah, so you can see that uh, there was the default network policy installed in the new namespace, and also um, part of the profile was uh, role bindings that automatically got populated into uh, the namespace. Um, and so you can see the contents of the network policy that went into it. So I think that's the end. Well, maybe not. Um, <laughs> all right, now we're going to look at what the role binding was. But the point was mostly just that they got populated into the namespace, not the actual contents. But the contents are you know, what you would expect for the scenario. So the scenario here was like default, which means like a secure by default cluster. But like I said, there could be profiles for other typical um, use cases for secure for security and isolation. Um, OK, that's probably enough of the demo. <laughs> demo. Uh, it's, um, I mean, it's just showing here that it also installs cluster level uh, security uh, uh, policies, like uh, pod security profile was installed as part of the security profile when we brought up the cluster using uh, Cubatom and passed in the name of the security profile when we did that. OK. Um, <laughs> Yeah, 
there'll be more stuff going on here. There's a link to this uh, video in the, in the slides, so you can uh, find out what the rest of the demo does by watching the video. Thanks. Thank you. Let's try to. Yeah. Okay, next up, uh, three topics uh, for the non-Kubernetes policy projects. All right, hi everybody, my name's uh, Torin, and I'm one of the contributors to the Open Policy Agent project, and if you've seen the project before, our logo is a Viking, uh, so I think I'm gonna change it to these cats, because they look pretty cool. Um, so what I thought I would do today is talk a little bit about how you can use OPA in Kubernetes. And, but before I do that, I just want to set this up for people that aren't familiar with the project. So OPA is a general purpose policy engine. And what that means is you can kind of just use it anywhere in your system at any layer of the stack. Um, and the core thing that it gives you is the ability to offload policy decisions from your services. So if you think of in Kubernetes in the API server, uh, every time a resource gets created, that operation has to be authorized and it has to pass through a series of admission controllers. The thing is, is that right now, like when you do authorization, it's just using probably RBAC, and so you, you don't have a lot of fine-grained control over the types of objects that can be created or the attributes of the objects as they're being created. And then the other thing is that with the admission controllers, until recently, they were also compiled into the API server. So every time you wanted to like tune the admission controllers, you would have to like recompile the API server. But all of this has gotten a lot better as of 1.8, I believe was when it really got better, and then 1.9 and 1.10 have sort of made it, it's, it's in beta now and it's really well supported. So this notion of admission control is really important because every time you run uh, kubectl against your API server and you supply a manifest with a bunch of data in it, there's all kinds of fields in there that are interesting from a policy perspective. So you might want to be able to enforce you know, that all objects have a contact email on them, or that you know, if the application is a critical application, that the replicas are set to some minimum value. Um, or they, they follow a naming convention, or that images are pulled from some kind of common repository. And so OPA lets you actually write these kinds of policies. Um, I'm not gonna go into uh, any detail on how you write them right now. If you go to the website, openpolicyagent.org, there are a bunch of examples that you can walk through, and one of them is Kubernetes admission control. So if you wanna try this out, I would recommend you start with that. You can bring it all up on Minikube and, and play around with it. Um, and so, you know, the, the, the thing here is that like a lot of these policies are very organization specific. And so you don't really wanna be hard coding these things into like the upstream, um, the like upstream Kubernetes distro because they don't apply to everybody and they have this kind of nature of evolving over time, right? They're, they're hard to predict and they evolve over time. And so you, you really want to allow your operators to decide what those policies are that are important for the organization and then allow them to specify them and have them enforced and then also be able to audit them. And so, uh, we've actually got a number of people using this today, um, and it, the, the, the types of policies that they, that they come up with are like impossible to predict. So I'm not gonna read through all of these, but this gives you a sense of the kinds of things that you wanna be able to do. Now, OPA has also been applied in a bunch of other places in Kubernetes, uh, but I will say that admission control is by far the most common. So one of the initial integrations we did was actually at the scheduler layer. So we built a custom scheduler that allowed you to write the scheduling, uh, make the scheduling decisions with, with a, a, an OPA policy. Um, and that was uh, just more of like a proof of concept. It allowed us to test out the policy language like two years ago, um, and it worked. But what we found was that it's really not a good fit for the second step of scheduling, which is about weighting and spreading the load across your cluster. So it's really good at filtering out like nodes or clusters that you shouldn't deploy to, but you don't want to use it for trying to spread or optimize uh, uh, resource utilization. So that's not something that you want to use OPA for. However, for filtering or for authorization and admission control, it's great. And it's also integrated into Federation today. So I don't know if anybody here is using Federation, but if, you wanna, if you're using Federation and you want to be able to pick which clusters a workload gets deployed to based on fine-grained attributes of the resources or based on context, then you can use OPA to do that. But obviously Kubernetes is not the only thing, or the only system in the world. And so there's a whole bunch of other integrations that we have with projects like Istio and other service mesh and uh, sort of service frameworks like Spring to do API authorization, microservice API authorization. Um, it's integrated with Docker, so you can kind of do, it's actually a similar use case of admission control where you want to be able to control fine-grained attributes of the, the containers that are started. 
And then we support um, SSH and sudo through a PAM module. And we have a bunch of people using it for risk management in Terraform. Uh, okay, so what I thought I would also mention is that we have new support in v08, which is kind of exciting. Um, one of the things, obviously, like as you're looking at these, these use cases, there are a number of different enforcement points that we're working with. And so now you have all these OPAs running around in your, your, in your system, and you need some way to get policies to them. You need some way to test that the policies are making the right decisions. Um, you need to know that OPA is running the right version of the policy and so on. And so we sort of look at these, um, these, these challenges as like management plane or control plane functionality. And so we've extended OPA with um, a few different things. So we've added, for example, bundle downloading. So you can um, implement a, an, an HTTP API that serves up a gzipped tarball containing policies and data. And then OPA will periodically download that. Um, it'll make sure that it like caches it and it doesn't re-download it if it doesn't need to. Um, and then we're looking at like improving that to have some sort of discovery protocol um, as well as like cryptographic um, signature verification so that you know that the, the policy that's running in OPA hasn't been tampered with. Um, we've also added status reporting. So it's really useful when you have a mini OPAs running to know uh, that the bundle you gave it is actually active and that it didn't encounter an error when it parsed and compiled the policies and so on. And so it'll tell you that like the revision of the bundle that it's running um, and whether there were any errors. And then the last thing is actually really important. So this, there's this notion of decision logging in OPA now where every time it makes a decision, like every time it admits a pod or allows an API request or denies an API request, um, it will record that decision as well as the input that you gave OPA, as well as the bundle revision that, that, that is active right now. And then it'll buffer those up in memory and periodically upload those batches to a remote HTTP endpoint. And so then using that, you can actually do like audit. So you can know what uh, API operations have been performed. You can use it for offline debugging if you want to understand why a particular decision was made at a particular point in time. Uh, and you can also use it for like back testing. So for example, if you have a large set of policies and you are making a change to them, you might not be 100% confident that you can just deploy that immediately. And so what you want to do is like gain confidence in that. And you can do that by looking at these decision logs and running them through the new policy and seeing if there's a delta between the old decision and the new decisions. And if there is, then maybe you need to investigate that further. So this is just like an overview of the new functionality that we added, sort of in response to seeing OPA deployed in many different places. Um, we'd like to improve this going forward, but it's a good starting point, I think. So thank you. Yeah. I think, uh, we'll do questions at the end, I think, for everybody. So hi, everyone. I'm Itai. I work for IBM in the uh, research lab in Haifa. And I want to talk to you about Istio policies. So basically, we really like policies. I did a count, a word count yesterday. And we mentioned the word policy or policies almost 700 times on our website and almost 400 times in the code. And basically, if there is a function that the service mesh does for you, that Istio does for you, and you want to be able to control it, then we have a policy for you. There are policies around security, like authentication policies, authorization policies, mutual TLS policies. There are policies around traffic shifting, which is another function that Istio does. Uh, a whole bunch of those, quotas, et cetera. And there are policies around configuring your mesh. I don't want to go about all of the policies that we have. I want to focus just on authorization policies to give you an idea of uh, what we have today in practice and then end with what might be some of the ideas or some of the thoughts that we have in response to customer questions and customer needs. So basically the way Istio works is when a request comes in, and this is going to be the same for all of our uh, policy engines, request comes in, uh, the data plane is going to extract a bunch of attributes like what service is calling, the service that is being called, the API, user, methods, etc. All those attributes are going to be sent over to one of our uh, components called a mixer, where there's an adapter. The role of an adapter is to take those attributes, take some data from a backend system, like maybe where the policies are being stored, and then make a, an allow or deny decision based on the request attributes and based on the policies that are configured. 
And the same is going to be applied to any kind of system that we have. Now, this shows the backend system sending information over to the adapter, which is like a policy store maybe, and then we're pulling information from there about the policies. But the error can be reversed. In other words, we can have an adapter that talks to a backend system, passing those attributes, maybe translating into a format that the backend expects. And then you can delegate your decision making through Istio to your existing enterprise systems that you can make decisions in there. Uh, right now, we uh, have two built-in adapters. There's an RBAC adapter, which basically is very much like the Kubernetes one, possibly with a little bit of extension. Uh, but it does what you expected, roles, role binding, permissions, etc. It's pretty standard, and it will probably work for most of the simple use cases. We also have an OPA adapter, where you can exploit all of the capabilities in OPA if you have uh, more needs. If it doesn't fit into an RBAC model, then you can use the full power of OPA. But we really see people also looking to extend that by writing their own adapters. So if they have a specific requirement, like if they want to allow uh, communication between services based on a topology map that they have, basically they can load that topology map into a backend system and write an adapter that would only allow where the source and the destination are part of the map. Or we also see people, when they deploy on an enterprise system, uh, looking to integrate that with their provider or enterprise systems like a Cloud IAM system. Okay, so it's a matter of writing an adapter that can take the attributes, convert the format, and call back. Uh, this doesn't have to happen on every call. We do have caching in place for better performance. So when we get back a reply, it's going to say, and you can cache this for so many operations or so many minutes, and uh, based on these keys. So next time you see a request with the same attributes, you can continue to use the decision. It doesn't have to go all the way back to the backend systems or even to the control plane. Some of the uh, open questions or things, questions that we're getting from customers, and I think uh, Tim referred to those as well, is how do we do policy composition and control? As soon as you have multiple people defining policies at different times, different groups, how do you mesh those things together? And that's, that's difficult. I don't think we have an answer yet, but that is something that we're looking at, and I think that we're cooperating with Sig Auth on that as well. One of the things we notice is it's not doesn't really match with the Kubernetes model very cleanly, because if we take a look at something like priorities, it's not going to be part of your RBAC model. It's a, having policies that take into account the attributes of another policy. Like, I want to have a policy that says only people who belong to that group can set a policy that has a priority that is higher than mine. I'm not sure that would fit well with the Kubernetes model right now. Another thing or two things that we're looking at as we are expanding the service mesh to include more and more services is how do we handle multiple protocols? Right now, Istio does a good job on HTTP and gRPC. What happens if we extend this to databases, to message queues? Do we have the same kind of policies or do we need to change our policy model, our attributes? Does it still work together? Another question is how do you basically expose, or should you even expose, a single management pane to customers to specify policies. Right now, if somebody wants to set policies on network access, like I described before, they have to go into the Istio to set those application level policies. They need to go into Calico or any other kind of CNI or Kubernetes to set network policies. And they have to go into their cloud provider or another system to set host level policies, as an example. And the question is, can we take the information from the developer's mind and somehow extract it and use that application level policy to automatically derive network policy so that we can enforce the policies at the right location? Right? So these are some of the things that we're looking at and thinking about for the future. I'd be happy to take questions afterwards in the back. this way. Cool. Um, it's kind of cool that I'm last here. Spiffy is kind of ties a lot of this together. Um, I'm Sabri Blackman, work for Cytel. Um, I'm our developer programs engineer, so I'm sort of um, 
the open source community guy, if that makes sense. Um, a little bit of a really, really high level introduction to uh, into Spiffy, what it is, and how service identity really ties into all of these previous discussions. Um, why do we care about service identity? Um, in this example here, you know, we have a user's application calling to a payments application, um, and in any sort of secure system, um, that payments application is, is, it goes through the sort of workflow of trying to figure out who is calling me, um, is this service or user authorized to call me, um, and those policies can potentially change over time. Um, and so, Spiffy really is um, sort of a, a level set of, of uh, creating trusted identities, if you will. Um, and if you can create trusted identities, you can create and enforce effective policies. Um, in this case, like access, quotas, et cetera. Um, so many cloud providers and other platforms have their own constructs for service identity. Um, AWS has service accounts, you know, it ties into AIM. Uh, cloud Foundry has this notion of services. Kubernetes has namespaces, services, et cetera. Um, and they all really use these different constructs to control different aspects of policy around their services, whether it's access or billing. Um, uh, some infrastructure providers use these labels and things like that to control load balancing and egress points, so you can use it for network policy and secrets, etc. Uh, and so uh, those constructs work really well um, if you're constrained to one particular ecosystem. And so if you're using Kubernetes inside of AWS, you have you know, a number of constructs you can rely on to prove identity to any particular service. Um, but that's not really reality for a lot of organizations, right? So if you have multiple different providers, multiple different um, Kubernetes distributions, maybe you're not using Kubernetes at all for some of these services, how do you really tie this notion of identity together? Um, and so Spiffy, you know, we really do believe in this idea that service identity should be independent of the underlying infrastructure. Um, and access management rules um, that can be derived from that sort of stuff should also be um, derivable outside of the underlying, the underlying application infrastructure. Um, and so these sorts of rule sets um, around access, whether you know, network should, traffic should be able to you know, flow from one service to another, um, there should be some sort of uh, infrastructure independent way to describe those things. And that requires some identity that will work um, across these different infrastructures. Um, so what is Spiffy really? Um, this is a pretty you know, high level overview. Spiffy really um, is a set of standards. Um, Spire is our implementation of those standards. Uh, Spiffy is really three things. Um, ID, an ID document, and an API. Um, Spire is, like I said, is the, our implementation of that system, and you'll see how that works a little bit. And so first, it, it really is this local API that services can use or communicate to to receive identity. And that SVID or that spiffy identity really is a certificate. And so if you're familiar with PKI, this, you know, Sounds pretty familiar. Um, ideally, um, that API will exist at the host level, but you can also do sidecars and things like that. Um, and Spiffy defines this workload API, um, Spire agent that actually sits on the, uh, the individual nodes, implements this API. Um, goes back to that standard question. Uh, the Spiffy ID, or the name, um, is basically it's a URI with Spiffy. Um, that domain uh, in that Spiffy ID donates the trust domain. Uh, again, the API itself is defined as a standard, and the format of the certificate and the key are also defined in the Spiffy standard, 
Right now, um, I think it's just X509, um, although we're uh, looking to implement JOT um, certs as well. And so this goes back to that API service that uh, applications can use to receive their identity. Um, this is a little bit of a hodgepodge, but essentially that API endpoint allows for any application um, on that host to essentially prove who they are. Um, and there are a bunch of different uh, types of these uh, plugins called attesters, essentially. Um, that use the underlying infrastructure against a set of rules to determine who you are. Um, and so the EC2 node attester, or the uh, workload attester, excuse me, uh, will potentially use you know, your UID or some other um, information available on the kernel to identify you. Um, if you're using Kubernetes, that might be a label or a namespace or a pod ID or something like that. Um, and essentially you can associate those selectors um, in the, the spiffy um, nomenclature against a set of, of spiffy IDs. And so when you're communicating with the uh, Spire server, it essentially checks those selectors against what you're presenting it matches them against something it already knows, and it presents you the correct ID. Um, and this is really where the cool thing kind of, you know, what this enables really is an automated way to manage service identity. Um, these certs, because they are just X509 certs, but we are gonna support other formats in the future, um, they are entirely API driven. Um, so they can be rota rotated automatically, um, they can be revoked, um, we're working on that, but um, you can kind of imagine scenarios where there may be you know, a security incident where you may need to revoke certificates for a particular application. You can do that programmatically. Um, we're also working on, um, specifically with Kubernetes, um, being able to register services as kubelets come up um, and so having those kubelets uh, and those applications being essentially pre-verified um, through some service so those certificates already exist. And then I put load balancer configuration changes, um, you know, potentially being able to present these certificates um, to your load balancer. Um, because they are just X509 certs, um, you can use them for to encrypt traffic. So. MTLS, um, et cetera, et cetera, with uh, Envoy and, and Nginx. But these, S, these SVIDs, these IDs, once you've proven who you are, you can use these IDs to uh, present these IDs to rule system or policy agents, um, like OPA, for instance. Um, and so you can use these IDs to automate network policy or to enforce quotas. Um, and you know, when we're working on some uh, projects to embed those into debug, debug logs and, and tracing systems like OpenTrace. Um, and so really, once you can establish your identity and the metadata around that, um, you can imagine uh, what kind of decisions you can make around that. Um, where are we going next? It's just a little bit of a high level roadmap. You see uh, Jot is sort of in the, in the near term uh, roadmap for us. Federation, um, right now the Spire servers that are actually uh, issuing these certs, um, they're essentially their own domain right now. Um, and so we're looking at being able to connect different Spire servers to create um, federated services so they both trust each other. Um, high availability right now, uh, Spire servers are a single point of failure. Don't like that. Um, this is a pretty you know, important aspect of your service infrastructure. You don't want that uh, to be a single point of failure. And then delete and revoke, as I was saying before. Um, we want to be able to programmatically be able to delete and revoke certs, um, which enables some pretty cool security features and scenarios. Um, Go over this really, really quickly. There's a lot of work to do. Um, still pretty early project. Um, 
and the SIGs are pretty active. I would definitely uh, invite everyone to get um, involved in those. Um, there are bugs, you know, if you find them, please file them. Uh, and if you have time to fix them, we'll accept your PRs and stuff like that. Um, and we're also looking, because these, these node attesters and in these work uh, load attesters are plugins and are sometimes dependent on the application and, and your environment, um, you know, Azure support would be great, uh, or GCP support would be great. Um, if you uh, are using some really weird, you know, IaaS out there that can potentially be leveraged to uh, provide, provide metadata, um, we could definitely use plugins for that sort of thing. Um, and Slack, uh, we have a Slack channel. It's pretty cool. Um, and I think that's it. No. Questions? Yeah, so any questions since we already, you know, run over the time? Any questions? Uh, so if there are no, uh, I would like to thank all the co-presenters and it has been a really great session. And uh, please, if you have any other questions, reach out to these folks offline, okay? Thank you so much.